as a unique identifier on each thing, it can just check that and say, oh, have I already rendered this thing? I have, don't need to re-render it. If, otherwise, it would have to re-render every single thing. So this is, obviously, does not break our app, but this is coming from our other articles component. We'll just read through the warning here. Each child in an array or iterator should have a unique key prop. Check the render method of other articles. So yeah, totally forgot to do that earlier. Doesn't break your app, but let's jump over to other articles real quick and fix that. So what Kyle was saying was you just did the index as well for map. Yeah. So map can give you multiple arguments. The second argument, the first one's always the thing, the particular item that you get out of the array. The second one is the index of it. Now, a lot of times, again, when you're actually getting data from a database, they will the database will be the thing providing the ID for you. We don't have that, so we're just going to use the index as the key. Then you can just say key is I, so that way each one has a unique key for it. And that should, yeah, so that gets rid of the giant red warning that we had. So pretty simple fix. Doesn't break anything to not do that, but your app will not be as efficient as it could be, and you will have lots of warnings if you don't put those things in your maps, which get used all the time. Yeah, Pranav? For some reason, it wants us to render the function Okay, and we can take a look at that in a bit. I'm sure it just probably needs a style sheet imported or something. Oh, really? <laughs> so the Google fonts aren't loading? Yeah, it could be that too. So it might just be using the fallback font if it's not able to load the Google font. All right, so back to what we were doing. We prevent a default, so we can click on it and stay in the same place. It doesn't take us to the top of the page. And then, so far, we're just console logging toggled, which is not what we want to do, right? What do we actually want to do? change the value of show comments, right? Or this dot state dot show comments. And how do we modify state? Set state, never modify state directly. So we use the set state method. And then we want show comments to be the opposite of whatever it currently is, right? So we're saying set state, passing it the object that we want it to set state to, saying the show comments property should be the opposite of whatever it currently is. So if I were to console log this dot state after I run that, what would you expect to see? So the first time I click that button, True, right? Because we started as false. Let's see what happens. Oh, broke. What do we get? Cannot read property set state of null. Meaning what is undefined or null? This. And why is this null? We didn't bind it. So uh, Davey showed you a way to do the bind yesterday, which was binding it directly where it's called, right? So we can do that. Or there are a variety of ways to do this, probably at least four that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, since you've already seen that one, I'm just going to show you another way that's really common, because you'll probably have to read somebody else's React code at some point. So don't be surprised if it's done this way. In the constructor. You can just say this dot toggle comments equals this dot toggle comments and go ahead and bind this there. So right when we're constructing the component, we're going ahead and right off the bat bind it to the component object. So then even if we were to use it in multiple places in our markup, we wouldn't have to bind it every time. It's just the method as a whole is now bound. Uh, probably on a particular.
call of it. Like if you were had another on click handler that was calling it, you could rebind it to something else, I would assume. Does that work, Davey? I think that should. Probably don't do it this way. <laughs> yeah. So like I said, we'll and we'll we'll show you probably at least four of them total, but again, you'll have to read somebody else's code at some point. So good thing to see all of them. But this is a pretty common one. All right, so back to what we were doing. First time we click it, we're going to set show comments to the opposite of what it is. So we started as false, so we would expect when I click it to see that it is now true. But what? Why is it false? Does anybody know? I was super surprised that somebody in the morning actually knew. I think they've been doing a lot of reading ahead. <laughs> But look, we're actually showing the comments, so we know it switched to true. But my console log shows false. So the reason is set state is an asynchronous function. If you're not familiar with asynchronous, most code that you write, so looking at this, uh, the first line in this method is event.preventDefault. So that runs, waits for that to be done to move to the next line, which is this dot set state, uh, and then console log. The problem is this is done asynchronously. It does not wait for this to be done to run this line. So this line is actually running before set state has actually been updated. So like your state has not actually updated yet. So that tripped me up a lot when I first started doing React. So I did want to point that out specifically. Um, so let's talk about other examples. JavaScript uses asynchronous stuff a lot for a variety of reasons. The biggest one being JavaScript does a ton of stuff over the internet, which does not happen instantaneously. So say for instance, we want to get data from an API, uh, a backend server. If I make that request, I do not want to do that synchronously. If we do it synchronously, that means we have to wait for that request to be answered before we can do anything else. So I want to do asynchronously. I want to throw the request out there and just say, hey, whenever you get back to me, that's cool. I'm going to go ahead and keep running stuff. So uh, a request like that is an example of something asynchronous. Uh, and set state is that way as well, because for efficiency, React sometimes bundles up a bunch of operations and does them at one time. Um, so setting the state is not guaranteed to be synchronous. So it, does it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it'll be updated exactly when you expect. So how can we get it to? properly log this dot state. We've only ever showed set state with a single argument, the object that we're passing to it. It can take another argument, which is just a callback function. Um, so if we just do an anonymous function and then console log this dot state. So this second argument is just saying, hey, when you're done doing this thing, run this next. If I put it below that, then it's actually going to run before this is done. This is saying, hey, this run this function when you're done with that. So let's see what that does for us. So now, there we go. Show comments true. Make sense? Ish. Async's pretty hard to get your head around initially if you're not used to it, but just be aware especially because we always recommend using console logs to check on if what you expect a method to do actually does. If you don't know that, then you might think it wasn't actually working, but it is, so. Take that console log back out because we are sure that it's doing the right thing. And now you can see we can toggle all day. So great. So we'll do a quick commit on that. Toggle comments on button click. And I'll push that up for you. All right. So we've got to where we can toggle them. But is this what we actually want to render? Nah. Should we make a component that has what we actually want to render in it? Seems like a good idea. 
So let's make a comments component. And do our export. And for right now, let's just do a real simple one. I'll say something different so we're sure it's coming from here instead of our original one. And then we're going to import it into our article component. And then instead of showing this, we are just going to show comments. Just the comments that we just made. So this thing. So now when I toggle, we should see comments component. Ta-da. All right, but we wanted it to be an actual like text area input, right? I don't want just a paragraph. So let's do that. Let's put a div around it. And we're probably going to want to style it at some point, so we'll put go ahead and put a class name on it. And then I don't think we've used a text area yet. We've just used inputs, but basically a text area is like a fat input it's where you can put in a bunch of text all at one time. And then we're probably going to need a button for so they can submit it. And then we're using the class name of button because remember we have foundation in this proje project, so that'll make it look like a button for us. So now, there we go. That looks nice. Doesn't do anything, but it looks nice. Let's commit that real quick. All right, so how did you guys get the data from the text area or input or whatever you used into something usable? How'd you get the data out of there? I know several of you said you did it successfully. <laughs> how do you get data out of a form with React? Anybody do it the way Davey did it yesterday with the ref? Cool. So when, question for you, so when does your actual state of your component get updated when you do a ref? Like when does state know about it? It doesn't update sta state until you submit it, right? Meaning that until you submit it, the DOM is actually holding part of your state. But we're in React now, so as a general rule, we want our components to be the containers of state, not the DOM. So I'm going to show you a different way to do this. And this is uh, what we call a controlled component, meaning the state is actually um, what gives us the value of that text area. Uh, the way that it was done yesterday was an uncontrolled components, and there are valid uses of each. Um, in this evening's website, you will have links to several explanations and articles of the difference. But the main idea here uh, behind doing it this way is that the initial value is set by React, and then every time anything changes, that immediately changes state. So there's not this lag between when things change and when our React component actually knows about it.
So like we mentioned, we're going to need state. So let's go ahead and do our constructor. And then our state is going to hold a comment, right? And initially, what should the value of our comment be? Should it be, I hate orcs? You like that? <laughs> In a real website, what would it be? It'd just be blank, right? So we'll just start it as an empty string. And then to set the value of the text area, there's a nice easy way to do it. You just say value equals this.state.comment. <clears throat> so if I do put something in here, you will see when we load it up, that's already in here. That's cool. Or we can load it up as a blank string. All good. Now what happens when I try to type something in? Nothing. <laughs> and why? What? Because I broke it? Yeah, definitely. I did break it. What do we set the value to? Yeah, which is, which is just a blank string, right? So it doesn't care what I type in. It's like, no, you told me it was a blank string, so that's what I'm going to be. So we didn't give it any way to change it when we try to input stuff. So we tied the value, but then we also need a way to tell it, hey, I'm changing stuff, so update your state. So I've used a variety of events at this point. Another one that's very common that we don't have not used yet is an on change. So when we change, every time we type something, we want to run a method that's going to update our state. So let's just call it update comment. And then, before we forget, let's go ahead and bind to that so we don't run into weird errors. And then we can actually write that method. Okay. Um, when Davey comes back in, he can help you out with that. We kind of need to keep moving on the homework. All right, so every time we change, we need to update state, right? So we have the event. How do we get the value of the form from an event? Yeah, so we have the event target still, right? I know it's a synthetic event that's a wrapper over, but you can still call most of the same methods and it acts mostly the same. So we want to set state, right? And we want to say our comment is now equal to event.target.value. And then we'll go ahead and do the same thing we did last time, which is we'll put in an anonymous function so we can console log it. And let's see what happens. Open our comment box. Oh, look at that. So you can see we are instantaneously updating our state every time our input changes. Whee! And then you can do cool patterns. <laughs> we'll do a quick commit on that. And we'll comment updates. All right, don't need that console log. We'll take that back out. Uh, one other thing I want to add, it's kind of boring to have a text box with nothing in it, so let's just put a placeholder in. We'll say enter comment. And 
now, that looks nice, under comment here. And one thing you can do if you're not aware, see how this line's getting really long? It is perfectly acceptable to break this onto multiple lines so that it's easier to read. Because sometimes you'll have quite a few event listeners and class names and IDs and all sorts of stuff on a particular thing. So it could be either a super long line that's really hard to read, or you could break it onto multiple lines. Still works exactly the same way. All right, so we got that done. We can enter a comment. We know that our state is updating. But so far, nothing happens when I submit that. What should happen when we do that? I know, Kyle, you mentioned that you put it on an array, right? You had an array of comments? Yes. And you saved that in state? Perfect. So we got our individual comment. And then we also want an array of stored comments. which initially when we load is empty. Again, if we had a backend, we would actually do a request to get those comments from the server, and that's what we would populate the array with, but we're just going to start with an empty one. <clears throat> and when do we want to... So basically what we want to have happen, just talking through it in English, we are putting a comment in, so our this.state.comment is updating. When I push this button, we want that stuff, that's this.state.comment, to get pushed into the array, right? So what kind of event do I need to listen for? A submit? Uh, submit would work if I had actually done a form. We just did a text area and a button. It's not a submit button. We just do an on-click, right? Because the other thing with a text area, you wouldn't want it to be submissible with an enter, which normally would be if you did an actual form. Because um, obviously, what if I just want to hit enter to have more lines on my comment? So we'll just do an on-click here. And let's call that this.add comment. And then before we forget, we'll go ahead and bind it. <coughs> so let's think about websites that we may have used that have comments on them. What sort of information does a comment have? Is it usually just the text? Nah, what other sort of information do you get? A user? What else? Timestamp? Yeah. Let's try that. I don't think we can really do user because we don't have users in this. We could make some up, but <laughs> let's at least put a timestamp on it. That'd be cool. So let's do, let's make an actual comment object. And it's going to have a couple properties of a timestamp property. You can just say new date. That's a built in JavaScript thing. You can just make a new date object. Uh, and then we want the text, obviously, right? And what's the text equal to? Comment? Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> but this.state.comment, right? That's where we're storing it. So for now, let's just console log that. See what that looks like. The best comment ever. There you go. Got a nice object with a timestamp and some text. Super cool. 
So let's push that object onto state. Do we ever modify state directly? Nah, that's ridiculous. We gotta use set state. So the easiest way to do this probably is to make a copy of state first and then modify that copy and then set state to the modified version. So let's do make a copy of this dot state. Everybody remember this from yesterday? Spread operator. So it's basically saying, hey, this is our new object defined by the curly braces. And I want you to go through this dot state and make a copy of every key value pair in there. So we just made a copy of our current state and saved it to a local variable state. And then we want to, it's just an array so we can push onto it, push our comment onto that array. And then set our state to the new state. And again, we're going to pass a second argument because it would be nice to see what our new state looks like then to make sure we did it right. So let's see how that looks. No, this is the best comment. All right, so our comment is still set to know this is the best comment. Our comments array now has an object in it, which looks like, yeah, our object that we made with timestamp and then the text. Cool. Now, when you submit a comment, do you want the comment to stay in the text box? No, nah, that's ridiculous. How would we clear it out? You could do a reset, or since it's tied directly to state, we could just set comment back to an empty string. So let's just do, so we did state comments push comment, and then we can say state.comment equals empty string. So now I'm going to type something in, submit it, clears back out. Sweet. So we took it out of here, made our awesome comment object, which has the text and a timestamp. So the last step that we need to do is what? Post it, like render it, yeah. So we just need to render the array of comments, which we've rendered arrays before, right? We did that for the articles. So let's do that. So we probably want to render them just pretty much right below the button, right? That'd be a good place for them. Do the curly braces to get a JavaScript context. Actually, before I do that, I've been a little bit since I did a commit, so I'm going to do that first. Um, All right, so now curly braces, what am I mapping over? What's my array? Yeah, that's how I say that comments, right? Map. So we're going to have an individual comment. We also know that when we map, we probably want a unique index as well. So we'll go ahead and just assume that we're going to need that. And then let's make 
a comment doohickey component. And we'll need to pass the comment in, right? Otherwise, it's not going to know about it. And it's going to need a key, too. So is our comment component going to need to know anything about state? Is it going to need its own state? Or is it just pure UI rendering? I saw some nods to the pure UI rendering, right? It doesn't need its own state. It's just rendering these objects that we have in an array. So we could do a stateless functional component. So we can do function comment. Takes in props argument. And we just want to return put a class on there for styling purposes. And then to do the date properly, we need to do some additional manipulation of it. So we're just going to do the text for now. If you want to do that on your own later, feel free. Make it look totally sweet. But So if we're doing the text, what's that going to be? Props dot what? What do we pass it in as? Yeah. Props dot comment, and then if we want the text from it, dot text, right? So by passing it in as a prop, React attaches that to the props argument, or to the props object that gets passed as an argument to our comment function. And so then we can access that by props.comment. And we specifically want the text property. So ta-da. They don't look super great. It totally works. Also, I'm going to take this console log back out. <coughs> so yeah, any questions about how any of that works? So we just made a stateless functional component to render a bit of UI. And we just want the comment text in there. So as we map over our state.comments array, it's going to make one comment for each of them, pass the comment in as a prop, so we can access the text of that comment as props.comment.text. Make sense? Awesome. So I think if we just do a little bit of styling, we're probably done. So let's add some comments.css. And it'd probably be nice if we had some space between the button and here, right? So let's do target our comments class. Let's put like 25 pixels on the top. Let's not forget to import our style sheet. There we go. Now we got some space. Let's do this button doesn't look anything like our other buttons, right? Looks a little out of place. We like our gold buttons. So if we're targeting the dot comments div. So that's this div, and we want the button inside there. We can do dot comments button and say background color. And that's clearly an E9 CF55, as we all know. And then we also want it to, like these other buttons, change color when we hover over it. So we can use the hover pseudo class. 
And I'm thinking probably a B69C22 would be appropriate. Yeah, that seems good. Ooh. All right, I want to make sure that Davey has enough time for the rest of the class, so we'll just copy-paste the rest in. But basically, <coughs> what we're going to do for the rest is give these their own, give them some space between comments that we render, add some border between them so they're visually different, and then make the backgrounds alternate just slightly. So I'll make sure to get this pushed up here shortly. But that's basically all these are doing. Adding some space around the comment, giving it a border, uh, actually giving that border a little bit of radius on the first one and the last one. And then, have you done any nth child stuff? I don't know a few of you have. So just for all the even numbered ones, we give it a slightly different background color. Oh, look at that. So nice. You can see there's a little bit of radius on the edges there, but not any of them in the middle. Cool. So congratulations. You made it through the hardest level of homework. And style it. Any questions before we go to break? That should be all pushed up. Hope you learn learn some new things about controlled components and some different ways to do things. But yeah, go ahead and take a 10-minute break, and then we'll do some more stuff.